when it comes to a cool factor, nothing comes close to a mini build. This little bundle of tech awesomeness. It, it's so compact, so precise, it delivers pure geek pleasure every time. I mean, they do have a sizable market following and their own lineup of hardware, including power supply units, uh, cases, and obviously motherboard. Today, we are reviewing the X570i Aorus Pro Wi-Fi. An absolute condensed of power coming in a small package and I am dying inside, dying not to be able to make any kind of jokes and keep this show family friendly. Smaller motherboards are the product where manufacturers can more easily differentiate themselves and it's not given to all of them to be able to put it off because to balance size, power, aesthetic and budget is probably the most extreme exercise you can have on the manufacturing market and to be absolutely uh, uh, honest, not many of them um, you know, can manage to Put it off. A few months ago, I had reviewed the excellent uh, ROG, uh, ROG X570 Impact, but that amazing motherboard come, came at a $500 price tag. Today, the Aorus Pro Wi-Fi cost $220. So how did they do it? Now, starting with the obvious. We're dealing with an eight-layered PCB Mini ITX motherboard. That means a 17 centimeter square. Now, let me be clear. Larger motherboards have more space where they can, you know, lay out their components, meaning less chances of having signal interferences. And so they can get away with only four or six layer PCB motherboard. But when you're squeezing all those components in such a smaller, form factor, what happens is that you have a much higher chance of signal interference between those components and uh, as a consequence, an unstable product. So having eight PCB layers here makes complete sense. It will give us this extra isolation to avoid those kind of issues. And so kudos to ours for that. VRM wise, again, this board is unique. We have eight real dedicated 70 amps phases. Let this sink in. Um, 70 amps by 8, 540 amps of CPU centric power delivery. This is ginormous, even on an ATX or an EATX motherboard. Enough to OC the most demanding Ryzen 3000 series processor out there. Six core, eight cores, 12 cores, 16 cores, name it. Heat wise, well, uh, let's start with the fact that we do have an eight layer PCB, meaning a better heat dissipation through the entire layout. And on top of which we do have a massive backplate uh, on the back of our PCB, which will give our power stages much, much more cooling surface. And let's not forget a rather premium and massive uh, heatsink, which will provide all the radiating surface necessary to keep our power stages cool at all time. For example, with an overclocked 12 physical core, at no point did I see uh, the VRM going beyond uh, 70 degrees Celsius, which makes this board a jewel of efficiency. And um, let me be clear, what ours did here is a perfectly balanced product when it, in terms of balancing uh, size, power delivery, and heat dissipation. Uh, the most fundamental solid base you could hope for for any kind of motherboard full stop. Memory wise, we're dealing with a dual extended channel supporting up to 64 gigabyte of DDR4 RAM, overclockable up to a whopping 4.4 gigahertz if coupled with a Ryzen 3000 series CPU. Staying in the memory, we have two M.2 solicited drive, one in front and one on the back of our board, coupled with a Ryzen 3000 CPU and therefore unlocking our board PCIe 4.0 abilities. The front M.2 solicited drive will be able to swap data up to an impressive 64 gigabit per second. Note that the M.2 solicited drive located on the back can only transfer up to PCIe 3.0 standard, Therefore, up to 32 gigabit per second only. But here, uh, we do have an issue, or uh, I thought so. Um, our M.2 solicited drive sticks can get really, really hot. And they are sandwiching our X570 chipset, our 11 watt 
X570 chipset, which itself is very hot. So you see where I'm going with that. We have a bunch of very hot components in a very small area of our small motherboard, which could translate in a thermos throttling nightmare. But thanks to the double heatsink configuration of this motherboard, and despite a rather brutal uh, stress test, I could not detect any components going above 80 degrees Celsius. So definitely the second great engineering feat of this motherboard. Double kudos to ours for this. Storage-wise, we do have our usual six gigabit per second SATA plugs, four of them, and in the minimalist spirit uh, of uh, the build this board was meant for, I would have liked to see less SATA plugs uh, for more features. We have M.2 solid state drives and you're not gonna be placing mechanical or solid state drive, at least four of them, on, on, a, on a small compact chassis. So even though they're still useful, I think we could have replaced a couple of them with more needed features export wise. We do have a single metal reinforced 16 slot, 16 speed PCIe slot. Note that one coupled with the Ryzen 3000 processor, your board PCIe 4.0 abilities will be unlocked therefore doubling the available bandwidth of your PCIe. But, 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 does this mean your video card would run twice faster? Oh, child, of course not. It's not that easy. Our video cards, are the best video cards we have today, can barely bottleneck the PCIe 3.0 standard, so let alone the 4.01. Uh, no, instead, and especially in the case of this motherboard, it's more of a future-proofing advantage more than anything else. Back AI-wise, first let's note the presence of a very well padded integrated IO plate, always a good sign. And starting from the left, we have, well, three video outputs. And my issue here is that Ryzen processors, which come with integrated graphics, are the least powerful one of them. And obviously this board VRM was developed for the most powerful Ryzen processor um, uh, there are, which do not have integrated graphics and which cannot use any of the video output. So uh, whilst I do understand the necessity to have one video output to access the BIOS in case of trouble, I really do not see why we have three of them and I would have removed two to the benefit of more USB plugs. Next, we have four five gigabit USB plugs, two 10 gigabit USB plugs, including a Type-C. See what I mean when I said I'd rather see more USB plugs instead of video outputs, because two 10 gigabit plugs is really not much. A Q Flash Plus button, which will allow us to access our BIOS without a CPU or memory, which in my opinion is a crucial function. So kudos for ours, to ours for adding it here and something I'd like to see on all motherboards everywhere every time in the universe. A gigabit LAN, a dual band Wi-Fi 6 adapter able to transfer data up to a whopping 2.4 gigabit per second. And finally, our usual 1220 Realtek codec, which thanks to having both left and right audio channel on different PCB layers, since we have eight here, it's not so difficult, uh, does a great job at both uh, giving us crystal clear, really good quality audio in gaming and also an, um, a static free recording, which is rather rare these days on integrated mother codecs. Front panel connector wise, we really don't have much. One five gigabit 3.2 USB connector and one USB 2.0 connector. And that's fine. It's a small motherboard. But you remember when I said we should have had less SATA plugs instead of four, two would have been fine. Instead of those two, having a, um, a Type-C front panel connector would have been really, really cool. Next, we have two PWM fan connector, which seems very little on any given motherboard, but which does not bother me one bit here because these are hybrid connectors, meaning that they can individually support either PWM fans, all-in-one uh, water cooling solutions, or dedicated water pumps, or even a flow sensor only as far as I know, Gigabyte uh, equipped their motherboards with hybrid fan connectors, which I would love to see on all motherboards. Now, troubleshooting wise. Well, apart from the Q flash we saw on the back IO, there is absolutely nothing, not even an easy debugger, which I think is a real mistake. When you're dealing with that much power, eight power stages, when you're dealing with very powerful processor or a PCIe 4.0 enabled system, 
uh, things can go wrong. And having an easy debugger is really the very minimum required to guide you through the troubleshooting process. So uh, again, having all the setup logs could have removed one, two, or even the four of them and also add an easy debugger there. Something that Arrows should keep in mind for the next iteration of this motherboard. Now, this would not be an Arrows gaming motherboard without the usual infestation of RGB connectors, which has been creeping into our computers for the past decades and which no amount of hand washing will save you from. Starting with an addressable RGB strip nested on our PCB and two connectors for our RGB exports, including an addressable one. And in my opinion, plenty enough. Now, in conclusion, the X570 Arrows i Pro Wi-Fi will run you about 220 US dollars before taxes, which is, despite some missteps, an absolute bargain. I mean, I'm gonna start with the bad points here. The fact that we have a useless amount of, of integrated display outputs, three of them was ridiculous. We should have had more USB plugs, uh, either on the back IO or on the board, and uh, the absence of easy debugger is really something I regret. But these do not take the fact that fundamentally, the X570 Arrows I is and remain one of the most powerful gaming motherboard on the market full stop take away the fact that it is a mini itx motherboard if you had to take the, the the vrm and put it on an atx motherboard it would remain one of the most powerful motherboard you could have or could afford at 220 dollars its engineering fundamentals have been delivered absolutely flawlessly and brilliantly the vrm coupled with an eight layer pcb really delivers this very stable and durable uh, powerhouse, which you know is probably one of the most performant overclocker you can you can find today. So uh, yeah, at two hundred and twenty dollars, if you're on the market for something different and definitely uh, a good, powerful, affordable mini build, this is where I would start, and obviously where your money needs to be.